Hello, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and get started here. Um, so we're going to be talking about, uh, I think this is probably a little bit different than some of the other talks we've seen since we've been here. Um, we're, uh, we're from Austin, Texas, and we know, we know Boyd Hempel, who gave the, um, who gave the, uh, the talk yesterday, uh, the keynote. And um, he sort of dropped it on us when we were first starting to cut our teeth on Docker. Um, he works at Stack Engine, which is another company in Austin, Texas, that does Docker orchestration. And um, he thought that the way that we um, approached uh, Docker um, was interesting. Um, he calls it interesting. I call it having no freaking idea what we're doing. <laughs> so uh, that's what, what this is sort of focused on. Um, so really, really quick, just who we are. Uh, this is my colleague, Steve. Um, Steve has done a lot of stuff, um, seen a lot of companies. Uh, we brought him in to sort of own our uh, continuous integration and continuous delivery uh, pipeline. We, uh, at, at Spareflip, sort of knew we wanted to do uh, CI and CD, um, but had no idea how to implement it. And Steve has been um, really instrumental in, in making all that happen. Um, I'm a software engineer at Spareflip. Um, I've been there for about six years. And my biggest, um, I think, accomplishment is frankly uh, convincing Steve to let us keep playing with, with Docker. So. That'll be a couple as we go through the, uh, the talks here. Um, Sparefoot, so what we do. Um, my marketing team really hates it when I say this, but I think the easiest way is to conceptualize it. Um, we're like a hotels.com for self-storage, um, that storage, like you put your stuff in storage. Uh, the company is uh, seven years old. Um, we're lucky in that uh, when, we, when we sort of started the company, we were able to get everything into AWS, so we're virtualized from the very beginning. We have uh, 40 developers right across seven different teams. And uh, we've been running Docker in quote unquote production since, since 2014. Um, sort of went over this already, but one of the things I, I really want to talk about here is that this talk is really going to be focused on sort of the process. We're going to deep dive on a couple of things where we think we can send you guys off in the, in the right direction if you guys are planning on um, sort of extending your Docker usage all the way through production. Um, but we're by no means Docker experts. Um, we're good at a lot of things. We're good at A-B testing. We're good at continuous uh, delivery. Um, we're good at engineering. Um, we're still cutting our teeth on Docker ourselves. Um, but uh, we, we did sort of stumble across this, this process that we want to sort of walk you guys through. So uh, chapter one, um, hackathons and Docker. So if I try to think about why we as Fairfoot try new things, I think it breaks down like this. Um, one percent of the time we're solving a real world problem, 99% uh, of the time someone saw it on Hacker News. And uh, so that was the case with, with Docker. Um, we do quarterly hackathons. At, uh, at Sparefoot, and um, somebody had the idea, hey, um, Docker and, and what's now called Compose, then it was called Fig, um, solves an interesting problem for us in that we can start to, um, we start to, to build our production infrastructure on our own laptops. So we thought that was pretty neat. Um, and we think about sort of what you want in your local dev environment. Uh, two things were super important to us. We wanted to be as close as possible to production, and we wanted um, the, the development environment to be as fast as possible for interactive use, right? You don't want to build something. Uh, we, we do a lot of interpreted languages, so there's not a compilation step there for us. And uh, this is what we began working with um, in the early days of Fairfax. Um, sort of this, uh, everybody built their own uh, laptop. It was an app to get installed, a brew install, depending. Uh, you built your stack. Um, by the time we got into uh, the hackathon, we had sort of um, we sort of evolved to this. Uh, we're using Vagrant. People here use Vagrant. Awesome. Um, so Vagrant was the was the big uh, it was a big moment for us in that it, instead of taking a new developer taking a week to get ramped up, uh, we could have a developer ramped up in, in a day. Um, so you're, you're on your uh, local <coughs> development box. You're running Vagrant. Uh, Vagrant is wrapped with Ubuntu, which is what we're running in, in production, and then your applications are are provisioned um, on top of Ubuntu. Um, Complexity starts to creep in, though, um, in, our, in our actual production environment. So you start stratifying uh, your app uh, tier, your service tier, your data tier. Um, and this starts to make it difficult to, to model in this approach, right? Um, all of a sudden, you're, you're installing Solar, you're installing Redis, you're installing MySQL. So the idea for the hackathon was basically, hey, can we do all this in Docker? Can we um, you know, basically run Vagrant and Ubuntu and then run uh, Docker within that and start to model um, our production infrastructure in Docker? And, uh, and we work. And we, we stumbled upon Fig, uh, now called Compose. And this became a, a really elegant uh, solution for, for this problem. Now, um, truth be told, we didn't end up uh, implementing this. It was sort of like a, a neat, like, hey, we can do this now. But we learned some really, really cool things from the hackathon. Um, 
we learned that uh, Docker creates a, an interesting um, application isolation for us in a super lightweight way. Um, the other approach that I didn't mention here is we, we tried doing this with Vagrant. Um, you can't run too many Vagrant boxes, they're, they're, they're super heavy. Um, Compose was fantastic for local development. It actually, um, I think we have a little bit of a chasm sometimes between our ops groups and our engineering groups. Um, and actually being able to see how things are, how the uh, containers are orchestrated, they're talking to one another, is sort of, um, is a facsimile of what's going on in our, in our production infrastructure. Um, Vagrant and Docker, we found a, a clever little way to um, give us that uh, interactive local development I was talking about. Um, Vagrant has the concept of sync, sync folders. We were doing a little bit of hacking around um, uh, making that work with uh, Docker volumes, so you would be um, coding on your local machine, and uh, that was running on your um, virtualized dev environment. And like I mentioned, I think the most important thing is we started to build some institutional knowledge around, around Docker on our engineering team. So, uh, Chapter two, um, Docker in production. And this is, uh, this is kind of, and this is the, the Docker quote unquote in production 2014. Um, in self storage, uh, self space, uh, it's not quite as ubiquitous as, as booking a, a hotel room or an airline ticket. Um, so uh, at this time, about 50% of our bookings flow through our call center. And uh, I mentioned earlier, we do a lot of A-B testing and, and upstream uh, traffic source tracking. And so with 50% of our volume flowing through a, a call center that we had in Austin, um, we had to build quite a, bit of, uh, quite a bit of software around dynamically allocating phone numbers, tracking those to a visitor so we know which a versions of A-B tests that they saw, know whether they came from, came from Google Organic or Google PPC. Um, we then uh, used the Twilio platform to um, allow an end user to, to, to call, to dial. Um, we have a, a little microservice, a, a spare phone, we call it microservice that will uh, route the caller um, to New Voice Media, our phone provider. This is what I'm finally getting to. This all culminates in, we have an actual, an actual application that our call center agents use. It sort of ties all this back together. So Sparephone is able to sort of proxy some of the information about the visitor to the application. Um, we use some socket technology to sort of talk back and forth. At the end of the day, when you call Sparephone, we know sort of what you were looking at, where you came from, which versions of A-B tests that you saw. And um, when you book, we can sort of tie all that back together through our call center. Presented an interesting uh, challenge for us as we started to build this. Um, we had two super bright um, engineers, and again, um, something, 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 Hacker News. Um, we wanted, they wanted to use React and, and Flux. And I don't know if you guys uh, work a lot with Node, but um, if you ask the developer which version of Node they need, it's N plus one, always. And so we found this happening. Uh, I mentioned we do continuous integration, so working on the uh, local environment was working really well. Um, we'll uh, promote to our dev or staging environment. And then we'd, uh, we'd deploy, um, and we were maybe running version N on production, and we end up in this situation. Um, obviously, it wasn't great. So um, our minds immediately went back to that hackathon, right? Um, Docker, separation of, of sort of dev and ops. We sort of get the encapsulation of, um, you want to use a certain version of Node, go for it. Just put it in the container. We, we don't care, right? Um, code, libraries, package manager. And uh, on the offside, we have a really, really clean interface where we can start to, um, hey, we know how to monitor or log these containers, and we can orchestrate. Um, so it started to feel like a solution that could work. And this is what I sort of dreamed up when we, when we had this problem, right? We can build these immutable uh, build artifacts, and they will just flow through here. Um, Steve and the developers will be friends again, and uh, everything's going to be great. And I'll let uh, Steve sort of talk to you guys about how that actually went down. So we knew that we had to have you know a few things to make this work, and and Patrick said here we have this great solution for, for Docker. It's going to make it so much easier for you to get this out there. And from from day one, I was a skeptic, and no one ever accused me of being a visionary. I thought well, Docker, uh, this is not going to happen. This is not going to go anywhere. But so he, he incentivized me to do it. It's like you know, if I do this or find another job like that. <laughs> um, so we were already doing you know continuous integration. We were doing. Um, semi-continuous deploys, and we had other apps that we could deploy continuously. Uh, but we knew for, for this app, you know, this call center app, we had some special things we had to worry about. Um, there's, there's host volumes, you know, we're, we were r syncing code around, we were building containers. We have to worry about uh, the port forwarding, the host volumes when we start these things. So there's a lot of things to think about in terms of how we get to deploy these containers. So the solution that, that we came up with, and it's honestly it is pretty janky, we had these uh, bamboos what we're using for our builds, and we had some strange you know, build scripts that were running. It was doing straightforward Docker builds, but 
it was dynamically creating a, uh, a container start scope that would be, it would take input about what we're building, you know, what are the ports it needs to have exposed and published, what volumes we have to have. And at one time we were even taking source code for the app, r syncing that to the production servers, and then mounting those volumes into containers at one time. It was, it was really strange. Um, but we also had to support multiple environments. You know, we have a dev environment, a staging environment, and we have a production environment. In each of these environments, we have different requirements, different you know, configuration in terms of connecting to different hosts, databases, services, and things like that. So, and then another big thing is that we try to do like unit testing and integration testing. So after a build kicks off, <coughs> we deploy it, and you'll be able to test it, make sure it works. But one problem we found is that we would you know, push this out there, and then we'd kick off our tests, and they all fail. Well, you know, we think the container's running, but it's not fully up initialized. So we have a lot of false positives, and uh, it was a little painful. And we spent a lot of time, you know, with uh, Docker push and pull. So at build time, you know, whether you're building a feature branch or the master branch, you know, we're pushing it to the registry. Every feature branch build, we have a tag it um, with a build number for the branch, and we push it. Same thing for our master builds, and it was slow. And then as we were deploying, we would SSH over to the remote machines. We would have to do a Docker pull to pull the stuff down before we could run our, our custom container start scripts. And it just took a long time. So from something that we used to be able to deploy, to build as PHP or Node.js, I guess. So you could build it really fast, push it out there, start it up, it was fine. And now we have these you know, long builds, long deploys, and it just seemed a little strange. Um, so here's just the same thing I talked about, the host volumes, the ports. Um, let's see. And one thing that bothered me, you know, from an ops perspective, is that we didn't always have zero downtime deployments. So we would, specifically for production, you know, it was very serial. So if we had three hosts in production we were running these containers on, we would push it out there, or actually we'd pull it, we'd have to remote to it, we'd do a pull, we restart everything, and then we move on to the next server. And during this little rolling deploy, you know, if something major had changed in the, in the services or whatnot, you know, you could have downtime because it wasn't fast. And it was just taking way too long. So, in the in the beginning, you know, we used to have an elastic load balancer because, as Patrick mentioned, everything's in AWS. So we have an ELB, and instead of just having it route to a couple of Ubuntu servers with our app on it, you know, we switched to having an ELB that's routing to a couple of containers right in our app. So, yeah, we're running Docker. You know, we did it. We're finally in production with Docker, but. It's not really, you know, we didn't really containerize it. I mean, we just took one big app, stuck it in the container, pushed it out there, and it's like, woo, we did it. You know, well, we could say we, we were a Docker production. Yes, oh, so, so then we started looking at what some of the, uh, the real victories were for running Docker. Um, we were running our own Docker registry. You know, it's, it's open source, you can run that. And so we never dealt with Docker Hub at all. But we ran it in AWS. I mean, it was actually on the same box as our build server. So it should have been fast, but it wasn't fast. You know, we were using Device Mapper as the storage driver back then. Uh, it wasn't very stable. You, would, uh, you couldn't do multiple pushes in parallel. So if you had a branch build going along with the master branch, you know, they both couldn't push at the same time. If they did, they would collide. Both builds would fail. Um, probably about once a week, the, the container running the Docker registry would just go belly up. I don't know what's going on. It's just not running anymore. So the uh, the, call, the the team developing the call center app, they're like, Steve, what is wrong with this? You know, the build process sucks. You know, so we were running servers, we were mimicking servers. You know, even though they were in containers, and I talked about that little janky build and deploy process. There was no real orchestration in terms of getting it out there. And of course, if you wanted to roll back, say we deployed a new version, and it's not good, well. Good luck. You need to fix it and deploy a new version. If, if there was no real rollback. It was it was this bad. So once the app was deployed, I mean, it was the app itself was pretty stable and fast until it wasn't. You know, once in a while those containers would just die, and we were actually well, I'll get to that in a minute. There's another problem. Uh, I talked about the orchestration. I talked about the Docker registry being bad. We were using S3 as the back end. So when you run your own Docker registry, you can specify local storage or you know any number of things. And we were using S3. And that was slow. And there was no way to clean this stuff up. So every time you're doing a build and you push a tag, and since every one of our branch builds would tag and push, 
we would we were collecting several gigabytes worth of you know build artifacts in our Docker registry per month, and this it was just growing out of control, and there's no way to clean this stuff up. So, at a calendar reminder at the first of every month, I would just log into Amazon console, go to S3, find the bucket, delete it, and then hopefully I didn't need those images. So, <laughs> automation <laughs> engineer, <everyone. laughs> so, um, and I mentioned that. You know, in the end, we had longer builds. It took too long. We had longer deploys. And besides being in Docker, there was nothing really gained by all this. So um, Steve was a huge Docker fan at that point. And um, on, the, uh, on the engineering side, um, we, like I assume everyone that I've talked to at this conference, um, we're, we were deconstructing the monolith, right? And um, we came up with what I thought was a pretty uh, clever approach to doing this. Um, and I think it's pretty standard, right? You've got your application, your monolithic library, your uh, data store. Um, sort of put a REST API in between the application and the library, um, which is typically the hardest part to get the application to stop talking to the library and start talking to the, uh, the API to sort of achieve that decoupling. Um, we would then sort of uh, carve out the code that was uh, in the monolith or, or recreate it more often than not. Uh, so for example, our, our booking service, uh, we would take the booking functionality out of the monolith, separate it, and then finally uh, move the data over and we'd come up with these nicely um, segmented microservices that we'd put behind the API gateway and um, have our application talk to it. Um, this all worked out pretty well for us. It seemed to fit really nicely with the uh, Docker use case. Um, so Steve wasn't talking to me at this point, so we sort of did this on the engineering team without involving, um, involving Steve. Um, but we wanted to, uh, this sort of added a third dimension to what we want in our development environment as we started to build these guys out, right? Um, so we were able to get these out into production, um, but we, we found that we really have this need to isolate the microservices in our local development environment, right? As you, um, as you start to, um, go from, from one shared code library to um, seven or eight different microservices all with different stacks. Um, you don't want to have your application developers and people that are consuming those have to implement all that technology locally. So back to our um, Vagrant environment that we talked about earlier. Um, we, have these, uh, we have these services, all with sort of um, <clears throat> heterogeneous technologies behind them. Um, hey, what can go here to make all this talk to each other um, about the right thing to do with Docker? So, um, we were really comfortable with Vagrant. Uh, everybody knows how to run it. Uh, we've been um, running Vagrant at Barefoot for the last two years or so. Um, so, rather than go full Docker on day one, um, we decided to sort of take this approach. Uh, create a, a, a second Vagrant image that would um, allow us to, to run the Docker toolkit and we could deploy our service images onto that Vagrant box. While we're in there, we decided um, it might be kind of nice to, to also break out our, our data here as well. And so um, this was born Trace of Um which is what uh, every one of our developers is running for their, lo their local dev environment. Um, this actually solved this problem really nicely for us. So as we're building out these microservices, um, the, uh, the service teams themselves could um, create services, put, build, whatever, build them on top of whatever technology they wanted to, um, turn these into um, images, and uh, the, uh, in theory, the, the bigger box that we sort of shipped out to the other developers could just pull those images down. They don't necessarily have to understand that, you know, we're running Redis behind the scenes or Solar behind the scenes, or uh, even Node or PHP or Java. It worked out really well. Um, the other nice thing that sort of, uh, the sort of bonus here is it sort of created these, these pipelines in terms of ownership, so you had um, the service teams who, um, if they were um, truly service-based, would just own their image. Uh, in our case, you know, we had a, a services team that sort of owned all those microservices, we're moving them over. They owned the bigger box and the, the images that were on top of them. We had our uh, operations group and our DBA sort of owning the, the monolithic data tier, and then the application teams um, could each sort of own their, their bigger um, box as well with their applications. And so um, this worked out pretty nicely, but we needed a way to, um, to have the, the uh, engineers that were working on the services to sort of seamlessly get these onto the, the Vagrant boxes without some sort of manual process. Um, ideally, right, we'd push to a registry and then Vagrant would pull those images and hopefully we could sort of access control all that. Um, Steve mentioned, uh, we rolled our own registry, um, it was just hard. Um, you know, one of the things uh, for us, like we're not Docker experts, it's not a problem that we really want to solve, we just wanted something that we could limit access control and uh, that, that we didn't have to maintain. So we tried Quay, just the first thing, literally Google search, uh, 
uh, Docker registry that doesn't suck and, and Quake came up. Um, we rolled that. We've actually been really, really happy with it. Um, has access control, has this concept of robots that worked out really nicely for us. So instead of being a user, you can create sort of a, a, a robot. In our case, we created the Vagrant robot, it would generate a hash for us, and we just bake that into all of our Vagrant boxes. That would allow access control to the appropriate images that were pulled down during development. And the biggest thing, we don't have to maintain it. Core OS uh, maintains it for us. So um, the next step here was sort of uh, bolting this on to our continuous integration uh, environment. And I imagine this looks similar to what a lot of you guys are doing. Nothing super uh, surprising here. Run get um, feature branches. We uh, implement the gatekeeper pattern. So on um, you know any um, any, any uh, dev branch that we want to uh, pull request back in will be uh, built to the dev server. We then have a pull request code review step. We'll uh, promote that code to staging, and then there's sort of a manual deployment step. Um, with Quay, we were sort of able to mirror this on the um, on the Docker side. So um, without changing our process at all, completely uh, transparent to the developers, um, we were now building their service code to uh, the dev environment, the staging environment, and pushing um, tagged images along the way within Quay. And then you go sort of further down the chain as a developer who maybe has nothing to do with the services team, but you are uh, consuming the services, it created a really uh, cool local environment, right? So you have your applications running on your bigger box. Um, and uh, I'd like to say we thought about this ahead of time. We did, and our developer sort of discovered this. Like, holy crap, I can run automated tests against all versions of the um, service images, right? And with Docker being as fast as it is, um, we can actually bake that into our automation. So we sort of, as we deconstructed the monolith, ran into a little bit of these, some of these race conditions where um, everyone can deploy when they want to. Um, but what do you test your code against? Do you test it against what's on staging? Do you test it against what's on production? Screw it, test it against everything, right? Um, and this worked out really well for us. So once again, um, we learned some things. Uh, the biggest takeaway here was um, it was actually easier than we thought. Um, Quay, uh, I think, turned out to be a lot of the glue that, that we needed. Um, sped up things quite a bit. And then um, bolting this onto our existing CI pipeline, I think, was huge. We didn't have to go um, retool everything. We didn't have to go retrain all of our developers. Um, and that, uh, that being able to test against all of the, uh, the versions of a, of a service image was super valuable. Um, the weirdest thing that we started to, to run into at this point was that um, we had really quickly, and all, all this happened, I think, within two or three weeks, um, really quickly talking containers in our local environments, our dev environments, our staging environments, and we were deploying to production in, in a non-Dockerized world. Um, and so um, we sort of decided, hey, that was, that was pretty easy. Why don't we just see what happens if we, if we go all the way and push these uh, microservices out to production? Um, and so, so we sort of thought about what was required there, sort of identified the areas that um, some of what we learned and some of what we just didn't feel like was there yet. Uh, biggest thing, right, like the, the nailed it pick, um, we didn't know what we were doing the first time. Like the, the key behind um, Docker is not replacing a, a physical server or a VM, right? Um, and sort of um, from 2014 to now, a lot uh, orchestration tools have become a lot more mature um, and can handle a lot of stuff for you. Um, we needed a way to do uh, better deployments, right? Steve mentioned we had uh, deployments that had downtime. Um, if we had to roll something back, it was a very manual process. We wanted to get better there. And then finally, um, we had sort of sidestepped this problem altogether. And our, our first um, run at Docker is the configuration management. Um, Steve mentioned uh, when we tried it with him with the call center application, um, the code was still sort of dynamically linked in. So our configuration was still living at the code level. We didn't have immutable build artifacts. So um, orchestration. Um, this was, uh, I think, the biggest thing enabling us to get this stuff out into production. Um, pick an orchestration tool. We, uh, we chose Rancher, um, and we think they're great. There are a lot of other options out there. Um, Docker makes a lot more sense. Like jumping into this early um, in 2014, sort of before all this stuff was there, um, it was hard to sort of see, like, hey, what am I really getting from Docker? With, with these tools and, and sort of the level of abstraction they provide, um, it really makes sense and allows you to sort of solve the, the actual production problems that you're, that you're trying to solve. And I'm going to let Steve uh, talk to you guys a little bit about um, how we solve those challenges. Okay. So yeah, so Patrick came back and said, hey, we're going to do Docker again. And I thought, oh, great. So you know, we had put you know, Yim out there. And I don't know if you had mentioned it, but we actually pulled it out, right? So it left Docker. And it was just back on regular EC2 servers. It was running Node. 
And so we had a meeting, he's like, hey, check this out. You know, I looked at a couple of services, and these were pretty neat, and I looked at them, I thought, oh, yeah, maybe. So, so I committed to, you know, doing a review of a bunch of orchestration services or container services and uh, trying to pick a couple of them that we thought would, you know, work. So I ended up looking at probably like seven or eight, and just some of the ones we looked at. We looked at Stack Engine, which is another Austin company, and it's a really cool product, but it, it was lacking one feature that we had to have at the time, and that was support for Docker Compose. So we wanted to have uh, this contract between the developers and the ops team. It's just a Compose file, say so this is what we want, this is the layout, the architecture we need. We want to give this, they wanted to give that to, to me and say, push it out there. And you know, like not having Docker Compose support in Stack Engine was a problem. I believe they have it down today. So in, in fact, I'm pretty sure uh, Boyd has said they have added this. You know, I gave them feedback at the time saying this is something you have to have. So um, it's good for them. And then it's still a really good product as well. Uh, Kubernetes is, is pretty cool. Uh, it's super powerful. If you're using it, I mean, is anyone here using it today? Okay, so there's no one here who has a PhD. Okay, so <laughs> I mean, it, it's very cool. It's extremely complicated. And I did get it up and running, but it was just very complex and probably more powerful than what we needed. Uh, Mesosphere is really cool. That was one of the ones Patrick originally showed me in that first meeting. And it worked, and I found it was a little slow. But when I was deploying new services, I mean, it was taking minutes for those to come up. And they were small containers. I couldn't quite understand why. Um, we looked at EC2 container service, obviously, since everything we have is in AWS. And they also were lacking the Docker Compose support. And uh, you had to use their AMIs, it looked like. And it, it was more of a, like, what is it, the Elastic Beanstalk, you know, config format. It wasn't Docker Compose, so it wasn't really going to work exactly the way we wanted. All of our hosts, and that's something we haven't talked about, the actual VMs that were running at the same time, um, we use SaltStack for config management, and so all our hosts were salt menus, and we wanted to be able to provision these ourselves and manage them, and with ECS, we really couldn't do that. So, then the, the last two we looked at were Tutum and Rancher, and uh, I guess there's a big discussion about whether it's Tutum or Tutum, but we've, we've heard it several ways. And so Tutum was one we looked at first, and it, it didn't have Docker Compose support when we were doing our little uh, beauty pageant, they have it now as well. I think that's something that everyone is, you know, kind of standardizing on. Um, but it was very beautiful. I mean, look at the UI. I mean, everything was polished, and you could do everything you wanted to do. It had the, you know, one orchestration point. Everything just worked. It was pretty cool. And I was looking at um, finishing up my little review of all these services, and I just did a couple more searches just to make sure I didn't miss anything that was randomly popular, wildly popular. And I found someone in like Stack Overflow had mentioned Rancher. And I went and looked at it and went to the website and said, well, I don't think this even applies. That's not what we're looking for. And then, then like a week later, I went back and looked at it and said, well, maybe I should just give it a try. And I downloaded it, installed it, and we set it up. It had Docker Compose support. It was like, wow, wait a minute. I can now take this one file, and they have a concept of a Rancher Compose. It's kind of like a, a file you put along with it to help with the you know, scaling and whatnot. Put these two things together. and pushes it out there, and it was, it, was, it was amazing. I thought, this is it. So we pretty much immediately you know, spun up Rancher for uh, some of the services. And we did this a proof of concept, and then I went on vacation for like two weeks, and I came back, and, and Patrick's like, yeah, we're using it now for production. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but it was, I thought it was more mature than most of the other projects we looked at. How about and, Doku? Uh, what's that? How about Doku? Doku. Um, the, the one thing about Tutum that was a little bit of a turnoff was that we had to orchestrate through their endpoints. So if they were down for some reason, obviously your production servers wouldn't be down, but you couldn't do any more deploys. So that was kind of a, a concern. We wanted to host everything ourselves so we wouldn't have that limitation. And the other big thing is that um, when we signed up for the beta for Rancher, you know, they got us into like a, a beta only forum where their engineers were actually on there. They were very you know, active. They were talking in there. And if you had a problem, they would help you debug things. You had feature requests, they were able to get back to you and say, yes, we could do that. No, that's a dumb idea. Or maybe you should do this instead. So uh, I was really impressed with how active they were. So what, when we uh, deploy this, we are, we're in AWS. And traditionally, we've always had uh, ELVs in front of our apps and our services. And for this new rancher setup, 
we decided we were going to put, we're going to keep the ELBs for each service, and then within containers, we will have an HA proxy container, and then the actual uh, containers for the apps and the services. So the ELBs are actually load balancing the HA proxies, and most of you probably know that ELBs are HA proxies anyway. So we're going from HA proxy to HA proxy to the actual services. So uh, before, this is the before diagram, it's ELB to the, to the apps. And now with Rancher, we're going ELB into, you know, HA proxy to the containers. So one thing I did want to call out is that we have the Rancher, like the admin server, it's just kind of like off on its side there. And we have another slide later, I'm going to tell you why that's, or Patrick will tell you why that's important. So just kind of remember that. Um, so you might be wondering, why do we have this extra like HA proxy layer? I mean, what's the point? Why are we adding this extra network hop for every single call? Um, well, the, big, the biggest thing was for deployments. You know, we could create these ELBs and then just leave them alone. We don't touch them. So when, when we deploy services, we deploy them as version services. So there's always, like, if we have a service called your booking service, it's going to be booking service dash, and then there's like a timestamp <coughs> dash, and then a number, which is the, the build job from Bamboo. So this allows us to have you know, multiple services running. And you can clearly see, you know, like how they order and when they were deployed and which ones are newer. And that's critical because if we deploy a new service and it, it's horrible, we can quickly roll back to the previous one. So our developers can actually deploy, uh, well, they deploy to dev every time they commit, you know, on a feature branch. We deploy to staging every time a pull request for the master branch is merged. And most of our apps and services now, the developers, can deploy to production whenever they want. So it's kind of a consensus deal, hey, can this go out? Yeah, okay, and then push it out. Did it work? Great. Did it, did it blow everything up? Quick, we'll roll it back. And they can do all that. Uh, we use HipChat for like group messaging, and we have a, a bot in there that allows the developers to deploy and roll back, and it works really well. So when we do a deploy, whether it's you know manually invoked by us or they're doing it through HipChat, you know, the bot calls scripts, we have like an authentication layer built in there. But in the end, you know, there's like one script that gets called. And what this is going to do is deploy the new version services. And then if you have HA proxies or service aliases in there, those get updated automatically. And we actually are using the Rancher API. So Rancher has the command line tool called Rancher Compose. It's basically Docker Compose, except it also supports the Rancher Compose file that goes with it, which is how you tell it you know, how many containers of the service do you want setting up the, the uh, service discovery and things like that. But so we're, but they also have the API, which you can query. It's not really well documented, but you can do a lot of things with their API. And one of the things that I do is, I before I deploy, I query. So for booking service, you know what's out there now? Because I want to get the version that's running now so that after I deploy the new version, I want to keep that last version, but all the other containers, I just want to delete them. Because if you don't, you'll start to rack up more and more containers and it just gets very messy. So having this also allows us to quickly roll back because we don't, well, we don't do it for dev and stage deploys, but on our production deploys, I actually generate a rollback file. So it's actually called docker compose dash rollback. And what it does is it has a stanza for the new service and a stanza for the previous service so that you can actually go back. And the, uh, the magic is we have the HA proxy definition, and it, in the rollback file, it just points to the previous one. So, um, so here you can see we deployed, and there's the new version. It's it's kind of blue green, but kind of kind of not. And you can see the, the yellow ones there are the old ones. And if something goes wrong, you know, the site blows up, you know, we just basically do the rollback, which hits that rollback file, and it points back to the good version. Okay, so and real quickly, it's like we're probably running low on time. Um, the big technical challenge, you know, for me was that we had these three environments: dev, stage, production, and we wanted to support all of them with a single Docker Compose file. And every environment is different. You know, you have different service, you know, definitions. You got to go to this host or this database, these credentials and whatnot. Uh, it's a little bit of like secret management, and developers don't want to maintain multiple files because it's you know prone to human error. So I mentioned we're using SaltStack. And Salt has the concept of grains and pillars, which allow you to put secrets into the configuration. And then what we do, you know, long story short, we have a template for our Docker Compose. And at deploy time, we render this template. It's got like Jinja, you know, like Jinja templating in it. 
And so it'll take data from the grains and the salt pillars for that application to dynamically create the file. And that allows us to have things like, you know, MySQL hostname, you know, username, password for that environment. Uh, what Redis server should I use? You know, is this a dev or stage environment? A whole bunch of different like environment variables. You can even have different like host volumes mounted and just all sorts of different configuration, all based on you know templating this. So, in the Rancher Compose file, um, you can see the, the first couple lines. There's like the uh, the set variables. That's, that's all Jinja templating, and we set a couple of grains from our deploy script, and then that allows us to just render this stuff out. So booking service dash you know prod dash and then the version numbers like that timestamp I talked about. It gets automatically filled in. Uh, this is probably very hard to see, but this is a chunk of the Docker Compose file. It's the same thing. It's just all that Jinja templating. And if, if you're interested in how I actually do this, I mean, the script, it's a Python script that talks to the API and, and, and calls the salt functions to render the stuff. And I, I can share that if anyone's interested. But you know, here's a big chunk of just like environments from the Docker Compose file. You can see we're just doing this salt pillar.get and different items, and it just fills it out. And it takes you know milliseconds to populate. And it's part of the build that generates these. So um, this is, I think I just talked about this here. This is the Python code we use to uh, render the templates into real files. And part of the deploy, the deploy election is called Rancher Compose Create and Rancher Compose Up. And I talked about that rollback file. So everything that magically happens, it goes through that orchestration point. And we have uh, a lot of good stuff. So the one last thing I wanted to add was that Rancher 041 probably three or four weeks ago came out, and they added support for variables, and which was kind of like what I had homebrewed with the, these Jinja templates. But I think what we have is still valuable because um, Rancher's variable support, they, they're looking at environment variables on your server that you're running Rancher Compose on. So for us to set all those variables, we would still have to get that, uh, that knowledge from somewhere. So we might as well still just get it from our salt pillars and our salt grains and just render these files. So. So even though they added something that we already had, it didn't. We weren't like Sherlock, you know, like Apple would. So it worked out pretty well. Great. So um, we had solved, uh, I, I think, uh, pretty elegantly the, the, the three problems that we needed prior to uh, deploying. So, so we went ahead and did it. And um, you know, holy crap, it worked. Um, this is our, our actual stack driver report, and that's uh, that's requests. Uh, we just replaced everything behind the ELB, like. Uh, like Steve mentioned, so we were able to, to report on this, and um, those are 200s and, and requests. If those go in opposite direction, you're in trouble. Um, so uh, great, everything worked. Um, in fact, it was it was sort of eerie for about a week. Um, everything was running uh, super smoothly in production, and um, it was the week of, uh, of reInvent. I was in Las Vegas for the uh, AWS conference, and um, <laughs> it didn't. Uh, what happened uh, actually was our uh, our rancher um, the, the instance that our rancher uh, Docker container was on the, the actual orchestration part of it uh, fell over. It, it was our fault. We uh, we rolled that on a, on a development server uh, that was being used by a bunch of other things. Uh, the server got pegged and um, everything just fell over. We couldn't talk to rancher anymore. Um, it was a really weird position to be in because everything was still working, right? But we couldn't deploy anything. We couldn't orchestrate anything. We couldn't. Um, Change anything. We didn't see anything, right? We were so uh, heavily dependent on, on Rancher. Um, however, uh, we were able to uh, spin up another instance. Um, they do have uh, some, some instructions around how you can sort of implement um, fault tolerance and, and high availability into your uh, your actual um, Rancher server. We just chose not to implement it. Uh, we were able to sort of bring this back online. Um, and on each one of the um, instances, we just blew away the Rancher agent and um, had it re-register with the new server, and uh, we were actually back in business. Um, talking to somebody in one of the uh, breakout sessions yesterday, they said that um, what you could actually do to make that a little bit uh, even smoother, um, Rancher stores a lot of its state in a, in a relational database, and um, apparently it's just an environment variable to change to actually have that not stored in the Docker container, but in like a, an actual external RDS instance or uh, MySQL database. So. Um, we did it. Uh, where are we now? Uh, we have 10, 10 microservices in production um, with Rancher and Docker. Uh, like I mentioned, we're a CD shop, so um, five to 10 deployments per day on average. All works really well. Um, our busiest services running on the, on the platform are doing about 50 requests per second. Um, and we're now sort of focusing on, um, you know, the, the, the microservices made a lot of sense. They were sort of new code, and so uh, allowed us to sort of cut our teeth on that. 
Um, but we're now starting to uh, start using this term that the boy threw out yesterday, um, strangling the, uh, the, the consumer applications, the consumer facing applications. Um, don't ever Google image search. I wanted to do a graphic here, and I'm probably on like a terrorist watch list now. Just do not Google strangling hands in Google image search. And what's that? Yeah, well, I warned you. <laughs> And, uh, and finally, you know, if you guys take nothing away uh, from this talk, and, and we're going to provide all the slides um, for you if you guys want to sort of deep dive, but um, you know, I, I think we learned a lot from the process. Uh, this sort of all just fell into place for us. Um, you know, we sort of um, we saw Docker and Hacker News, everyone was talking about it. We sort of manufactured a use case, taught us a little bit. We failed a ton. Um, I still get embarrassed talking to when, when Boyd was talking about Stack Engine back in the Yim days, and the things, the questions I was asking him, it was like clear that just didn't get it, right? But you'll learn as you do that, and then um, move on and, and apply you know, what you've learned at every step of the way, along the way, and um, you know, um, like I said, it's uh, become a, a super important part of, of our architecture, and has actually solved a lot of real-world problems for spare foot. So uh, thank you guys, I guess we have a little bit of time for some questions, if there are any. Yeah? Um, I wasn't sure, you, you had mentioned in 2014 you had the issue of pull and push taking more time. How was it at this point? So, um, Quay.io and our own local, you know, Docker on the build server. I mentioned before we were using Device Mapper, and that was definitely the wrong thing to do. We switched to AUFS as a storage driver, and that's also what Quay.io uses, and that was considerably faster. So, I mean, we saved minutes on the build just by changing the storage driver to AUFS. Yeah. Do you find storing uh, MySQL passwords in, uh, in the, the secure network? So we actually, I tried to talk about that in one of the breakout sessions yesterday. I said, what do you think about secrets and environment variables? And there wasn't really much discussion about it. Uh, the biggest thing for us is that our entire environment is locked down. And if you are on the host, then yeah, maybe you can look in the proc file system and, and get that stuff out of there. But if you're on the host, we have bigger problems. So. <laughs> So we don't we don't even SSH into these uh, the hosts that run Docker. I mean we don't have SSH on, so they're all salt means. So through salt stack we can actually re do remote execution and things like that. So we we feel it's it's secure for what we're doing. So along those same lines, you you since you're pushing everything down through salt, are you encrypting your passwords as they're being checked in? Are they being checked in as part of the version control? Salt, how are you managing that? Right. So um, the salt pillar data is not checked into like source repos. So. It's uh, not encrypted, but it's uh, salt pillars. The way it works is that you have to give like explicit targeting rules for you know what servers can actually see that pillar data. So um, we make sure that only the uh, or the hosts that are running you know these services can see that data. And since it's not in a like a Git repo somewhere, developers can't even see that. How long did it take to build out the production deployment? Oh, uh, it, it was fast. I mean. A day or two, and just compared to what we used to have in the beginning for doing those, you know, convoluted deploys and whatnot, uh, doing it through all through Rancher with Rancher Compose, it was, you know, I mean, a couple hours, and we had a proof of concept working. Wow. Being, being able to bolt that on into like our existing process and everything saves us a ton of time. For your pillar data, are you using like a database backend? How do you implement? No, it's a flat file, flat text file. Thanks, so.